service jobs. There are a lot of them in the state of Florida, aren't there? I heard this one the other day. It said, what do you call, did I do something wrong? It looks like it's up there. What do you call, while he's doing that, look at this way. <laughs> what do you call a Hillsborough College graduate with a bottle of champagne in his hand? A waiter. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I knew that was risky. I'm just kidding. Uh, a waiter brought a customer a steak. And as he brought the steak to the man, the man noticed that his thumb was on top of his steak as he handed him the plate. And he said, are you crazy? You have your thumb right on top of my steak. And the other guy said, well, what do you want it to fall on the floor again? <laughs> Disney employs service jobs and blue collar working jobs. Disney employs about 40,000 people. The Universal Studios employs about 2,500. That's Island of Adventure as well. As 2,500, excuse me, Universal Studios has about 4,000. SeaWorld uh, employs around 22,000. That's service jobs and blue collar worker jobs. Bush Gardens employs about 5,000 service jobs and blue collar jobs. There are a lot of service jobs in the state of Florida. A lot of service jobs. But service jobs and blue collar jobs must be respected by us all, amen. Because that's what makes us work. That's what keeps us going. We're to serve the Lord, and that's what I wanna focus on for just a moment here. We are to serve the Lord in the pattern, in the precept, in scripture, is that that primarily means worship. It does not primarily mean day to day, it applies to that, but the way it's used in scripture, when it says serve the Lord, it primarily often means just worship him. Exodus three and verse 12, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. I was referring to worshiping God there. Then Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? That means to worship God. Joshua 24, this passage that we just read, just the last verse again, and now... And, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, and those I named a moment ago, once upon a time, that aren't named among people anymore, that were on the other side of the river, literally forsaken, thankfully, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, worship the Lord. And then Psalm 2 and verse 11 says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. That means we are to worship God in a respectful manner and then rejoice also as we're a little bit trembly about it. And then we read this statement, Psalm 100 verse two, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Again, it seems that service is always connected to worship. So God didn't just call people to worship, but he also didn't just call people to serve him in their daily walk. You cannot separate the two. If you claim to serve the Lord, you must worship the Lord. If you claim to worship the Lord, you must serve the Lord. Matthew 4 and verse 10 says... Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. It's always connected. I don't know if you've noticed that, but they're always connected. Hebrews 12, verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have 
grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And then Revelation, the last one I'll point out here. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Again, connecting service to worship and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So service is always connected to worship. No truly true Bible student would ever claim to serve the Lord who would not and did not gather with the brethren to worship the Lord. By very definition to say I serve the Lord and you don't worship, you don't understand the definition. Or by very definition if you worship and you do not live for him, you don't understand the very definition. So we are to serve the Lord every day, but what is the pattern especially? We are to serve the Lord this day. So you serve the Lord Christ according to Colossians 3 and verse 24. So that's our purpose here today. I wanna look at three patterns of that service and the sub-patterns to that service in order to understand exactly what we should expect to see out of our daily walk, okay? That's where the emphasis is gonna be, even though it always applies to worship as well. Let's walk through that. Number one, behold the Pauline pattern of service. There are at least two distinct things he shows us over and over again that are referred to as examples or patterns by his life. We are to follow the pattern of togetherness in service to the Lord. That Philippians 3 verses 16 through 18 says, Paul wrote, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. So we are not to be enemies of the cross of Christ. That means that we are to behave very similarly and do the same things and think the same ways. That's who we're to be. So this idea that you can just be any old thing is not in the scriptures and not what Paul talked about, but rather there should be a togetherness of believers. And all, he also suggests following the pattern of his tireless service, that we are to be servants that not just together, but that we should be tirelessly working for the Lord and worshiping the Lord. In 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 8 through 10, he says, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. We are not to be lazy and in idle, amen? We are to work, but worked with labor and toil night and day. That's working when you work all the time, basically. That we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority. Paul says, I have authority to receive pay from you, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. There should be an ethic of work among Christians and we should all be tirelessly at work. You say, well, you need to have time off. Amen to that, absolutely. But it's okay to work night and day sometimes too. Now you can't do that all the time and shouldn't, but as a Christian, if you work during the daytime, occasionally you should work at night. And if you work all night, occasionally you ought to work in the daytime. And if you're too busy to ever work for the Lord, you're too busy, need to change jobs, amen? There needs to be some room for God. In Acts 20 and verse seven, they were together and they had communion. They broke bread together in Acts 27. So, and when did they do that? They did it at night. And then he taught till midnight and then he taught beyond midnight. That means that not only should we be willing to serve the Lord, but we should be willing to serve the Lord in worship even if the preacher goes over. Praise the Lord. <laughs> High five. 
The Pauline pattern of service. That's it. Together service and tireless service. Then there, behold, the prophetic pattern of service that is told to us in the New Testament that we need to follow this example. We need to take the pattern of patient service that's talked about in the book of James, brother of our Lord. James 5 verse 10 says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example. There were many prophets. Well, I have a lesson coming up kind of about them soon of suffering and patience. So their example is of suffering and patience. So if it, you have a problem because in your life, then you need to follow their example, patience. If you have a difficult person in your life, you need to follow their example, patience. If the building didn't get built for you, you need to follow the example, patience. Suffering patience, it's difficult. Patience is hard. I'd be fine with patience if I didn't have to wait on anybody, wouldn't you? But it's that patience. And it was the prophets who did that. Why, why prophets? Well, not only did they get mistreated, but a lot of what they said didn't happen in their lifetime. Now think about that. They foretold about the Christ. They never saw him. So you say, well, I want it now. <laughs> think about that. 600 years, 800 years before Christ, making a prediction that they would never see. 490 years, Daniel's making a prophecy about of something he'd never see. The, the promised land that Abraham would never actually get to appreciate and own completely. Things that they would not see. That's suffering of patience. But also take note of the pattern of persecuted service. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, verses 11 and 12, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely, for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yes, the prophets got persecuted. Many of them were killed, by the way. In Acts 5, verse 29, and then we find that they were beaten. The apostles, a couple of the apostles were whipped. And then verses 40 and 41, as they leave, they're going, and still going, oh, I can't believe they beat me. They're going, wow, we were honored by being allowed to be mistreated for the cause of Christ. Kind of a different attitude that when somebody speaks ugly to you in the foyer, isn't it? Or somebody does something in one of our ministries that you didn't like and you'd prefer it had been done a different way, but they did it their way. That's a little different attitude, isn't it? I noticed I an amen on that one, did I? Okay, so prophets, the prophetic pattern of service, and that is, and it's clearly a pattern, that of patience, but yet being persecuted. Persecuted primarily just means pursued. So if you have somebody who's kind of after you all the time, you're being persecuted. That's the primary meaning of the word. Let's look at the third truth. And that is, behold the personal pattern of service that we're expected to take note of. We are to be the pattern of respected service. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 it says, let no one despise your youth, young people. I don't care how young you are, you aren't to be looked down on. Amen? Amen. Nobody's to be looked down on. Ever. No one. Not even old people. It's about to turn 63. Those aren't to be looked down on. Let's try to make that real clear. 21st, okay. That no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word. Now see, that's not to the unbelievers. This is talking about, so it's right here among us. Be an example to the believers in word. Your words ought to be so pure. In conduct, your conduct should be so good. In love, you should be so loving. In spirit, you ought to always try to be positive. In faith, not doubting God. 
in purity, not messing around in those dark places. So if you want to really follow the Lord and serve him properly, you want to live in such a way that people respect you. They look at you and they go, wow, that's a good kid. That's a good woman. That's a good man. I'd like to be like that. But not only that, be the pattern of respectful service. Because Titus 2 and verse 7 says this, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. So this isn't just to the brethren now. This is in everything we do, wherever we do it, we are to allow others to see just a little, not show out, but they need to just see a little bit of who you are. Showing yourself to be a pattern that they could follow of good works in doctrine, what we believe, in doctrine, what we teach, in doctrine showing integrity and reverence, that's respect for all, incorruptibility. There should be a respectfulness in us. Not only do we need to be the kind of people that others would respect, we need to be the kind of people that are more respectful. When you hear other people being disrespectful, you shouldn't be among that group. We are not to be that group. We are to be the people who show proper respect to all people even when they don't deserve it. Amen? Amen. Amen. That'd be a good thing for us to learn, but it's not the easiest thing to learn. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, it says that we are to be a pattern of honest behavior that cannot be condemned. If you're an honest individual, I mean, there shouldn't be any question in your work ethic, in your life, with your mate, that they expect you to lie or deceive ever. We should be the kind of people that if we say it, that's what's going to happen. Amen? That's what we're going to do. And that will result, according to 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, in that your good will be praised and God will be praised and it'll be your personal good works that do it. So to serve the Lord we are to display some personal good works that nobody can make fun of. That's the pa personal pattern of service. So that's basically the lesson today in all. If you missed one of those things that we were looking at, we need to take note of the Pauline pattern of service, the prophetic pattern of service, and then that personal pattern of service. Patterns call us to serve or worship the Lord. We are not just to kind of live for Him. We are to live for Him 24-7, right? That's it. Every day. But you know what affects that? What you think of God. Some people don't live that way that call themselves Christians. Most of you do. I believe that. Most of you are trying to do just that. But some don't do that. Why don't they do that? Well, one of the reasons is because we don't have the proper view of God. If you don't have the proper view of God, it affects you. It'll affect you in your attendance. If, if you don't have the proper respect, you don't feel the need necessarily to come. But if you have the proper amount of respect of this divine being that's beyond the galaxy and the universe, it changes your perspective. You see, if you have the proper respect, it doesn't just affect your attendance, it affects your behavior in the attendance. It doesn't just do that, though. If you have that proper understanding of who God is, it affects you in your daily service. It affects everything. It permeates your life. It affects who you are. What you think of God affects who you are, whether you like to think about it that way or not. You are who you are because of what you think of God. James Michener, a few years ago, wrote a book called The Source. It's not a true story, but it's an interesting story. It tells a story about a man named Erbal. Ur he lived supposedly 2200 B.C. 
and he worshiped two gods. One god was called the god of death. The other god that he worshiped was called the god of fertility. The temple priest had told Erbal to bring his son to the temple and sacrifice him. If he wants his crops to grow, that's what was required. If he bring his son in and have him sacrifice, then his crops would grow. And so he obeys. And on the appointed day, without his wife or his child knowing, he drags his wife and his son to the scene. And then his son, along with other men who've been told to do the same thing, they involve themselves in a religious execution by fire to their God of death, and he kills his son. After the sacrifice, the priests announced that because of this great sacrifice this day to this God of death, that the God of fertility is going to reward them, one of these fathers. One will be chosen to go to the temple of the God of fertility and be with a temple prostitute for free. Her ball's wife is stunned as she stands there and notices the desire that was written across the face of her husband. She had never seen that before. And she's overwhelmed when it's announced that he's selected, that he lunges forward. The ceremony is over and she walks out with her head swimming and says these words, if he had had different gods, he would have been a different man. If you had believed in the God of the Bible and not the one in your head, how different would you be? Of course, if I was Michener, what I would have done, I'd have finished that story about when he goes to the temple, he finds out his wife's been pressed in to be the temple prostitute. That's the way I'd end that story. But he didn't end it that way. If we believe God is love and grace, we are different. We express love and grace, don't we? We were changed forever by the God we understand God to be. And now we follow the God of love and grace. You gotta believe that God's worthy. If you don't believe God's worthy, you come when you get ready. If you don't believe God's worthy, you pray when you get ready. If you don't believe God's worthy of the greatest sacrifice you could possibly make, you don't make much sacrifice. It all is contingent on what you believe. But if you believe that God is a God of love and grace and that he sent his son here to die on a cross to save you and you truly believe that, which I believe most of you do, if you truly believe that, it's no task at all to repent and make him Lord of your life. It's no task at all to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. It's no task at all to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And it is no task at all to spend the rest of your life worshiping him. I'm sitting there on the front row a minute ago and I was just thinking, I think I have taken communion over 2,600 times. Ain't no telling how many times you've taken it, is it? Over and over and over every week until we die. If that is the God you understand him to be, and you're not right with him, this is the time to do it. Won't you come if you need to while we stand and while we sing?